And now it's time for Mob Talk Radio with your host, Chef Canarsi. And welcome to Mob Talk Radio. I am your host, Jeff Canarsi. We are going to talk about Murray the Campbell Humphreys tonight. Uh, but before we get to that, there's something that's really fucking bothering me. Uh, I, I I sat back a million times and tried to figure out uh, whether or not I was even going to address this. Uh, and the first thing I want to say is this. I'm not a spokesman for fucking anybody. Uh, I believe in what I believe in. And if I have a friend that's in trouble or I know people that are, that are getting their balls busted... I'm going to speak up because that's what I do. However, when a rat, cocksucker, piece of shit, junky fuck like Frank Ganji comes onto my fucking site and starts running his mouth about shit he doesn't even know about, I have kind of a tendency to lose my shit. Uh, I don't know what Frank's problem specifically is other than he's a junkie. That's kind of a big problem. Uh, but Frank does this thing where he is nice to people, then attacks people. First of all, he's a fucking rat. He's a nothing. He's a nobody. Uh, that's the first problem Frank has. Uh, the second problem Frank has is he went on a tirade on my page last night talking about John Gotti Jr. and this glorious 302 that we keep hearing about. Uh, first of all, I don't even give a fuck about this issue. Uh, I think that I've addressed the issue before. Uh, you go back three fucking years ago, I addressed this. So really, I don't see a point in further talking about it. And then I went somewhere to eat tonight and I had to hear about it again. So all of that being said, I decided that I was going to come back to New York and I was going to talk about it. My job is not to defend anybody, but what I'm not going to do is let people that don't know any better, that believe John fucking A-White, that piece of shit that he is, and that fucking scumbag George Anastasia, you're going to believe what he has to say when he prints a fucking fictitious, not even real 30 fucking 2 and a book. You people keep pulling that up like it's a fucking real document. It's not a real document you're seeing. I thought you guys were all fucking smarter than that, but apparently not. So Frank goes on this tangent because at 3 o'clock in the morning when I'm fucking sleeping, I don't answer his fucking questions. So it goes from that to bad-mouthing Angel Gotti, goes from that to fucking saying I ratted out my fucking brother. I don't even know what the fuck this drunken cocksucker is even saying. He needs to stay wherever the fuck he's at and stay a rat and just stay the miserable prick that he is. I personally don't give a fuck what his beef is with the Gotti family. I don't really give a fuck what anybody's beef with the Gotti family is. That's not my fucking fight. Why people keep bringing this shit up to me is is beyond ridiculous. You think I give a fuck. So here's the deal. I'm just going to speak my piece on what I think. And you guys can do whatever you want with it. First of all, anybody that comes to me and tells me that anybody that talks to a fucking cop is a rat, well, then half of you would be fucking dead. Half of you that took a motherfucking plea deal would be fucking dead. Because if you want to talk about the fucking rules going back to 19 fucking 60, if we're going to go by one rule, you got to go by them all. They just don't change the rules to fit your specific fucking needs. So guess what? The rule back in the day was you don't fucking take a plea. If you take a plea, guess what? You're a rat because you're admitting something exists. You should be fucking killed by Cosa Nostra rules. So don't give me this bullshit that you think you're fucking better than everybody or that you think the rules don't fucking apply to you because they do. You cannot pick and choose what fucking rules you want to follow. Now that being said, this 302, first of all, I'm going to say this. Nothing that John Gotti Jr. said indicted anybody. Nothing he said got anybody fucking arrested. He talked about things that were 30 fucking years old that followed an FBI narrative that wasted their fucking time. They realized it was a joke, that he was playing fucking games, and what did they do as a result? Five trials, 37 months, diesel fucking therapy. 
That's not an FBI that's getting information from somebody. To even further that, the names in the 302 were either dead or never existed to begin with. The point is, the FBI does things intentionally to try to force somebody to cooperate. They do all kinds of shit. Look what they did to Willie Boy Johnson, that fucking cunt Jack alone. Look what she did to Willie Boy Johnson. Outed him in front of John Gotti Sr. How do you think that was going to fucking end? That cunt should be in prison because of what happened to him. She let it out that he was telling on people. What happens? He gets fucking shot, what, 19 fucking times by Tommy Patera? So don't tell me if the FBI does not fucking play games. The FBI can't get Junior the way they want to. So you know what they do? They do two things. They suddenly invent this five-page proffer session, which did not last that long to begin with. It went from 347 fucking words to five pages. What, what these assholes Anastasia isn't telling you is that Junior had an attorney that was there taking notes. You compare that fucking alleged 302 to the notes, they're not even the same. Things were added. To even further that, John Elite goes on a radio show and says, listen, anytime that anybody from organized crime talks to fucking law enforcement, they write what they want. So, so the 302 is inaccurate. That's the second thing. The third thing is, the third thing, and nobody seems to fucking mention this when they bring this up to me, Bonanno Capo, Dominic Sicali testified that the FBI proffer session was devised with Vinny Basquiano to use as an innocence defense and withdrawal. Talk to any fucking lawyer. They will explain that to you, what that's designed, designed for. Basquiano, Basquiano also told an individual, this is directly from an FBI report. Listen, FBI report sitting in my fucking hand for all you nincompoop, jerk-off, cock-sucking morons that keep coming at me with bullshit. This is it. You don't have this. I have this. You guys keep printing out George Anastasia's bullshit fairy tale. And you believe it. You believe it. Johnny White's a fucking rat. You're believing a rat. What the fuck is wrong with you people? Basquiano told individual that he was trying to get individual's approval to have a co-defendant meeting at MCC. That way, Basquiano could introduce individual to John Gotti Jr. Individual also advised that Basquiano talked about him using an innocence proffer session as a strategy. Individual explained that the innocence proffer is when one would meet with the government and proffer that they had nothing to do with certain charged crimes. Basquiano told individual Gotti Jr. intended on using this strategy. You want more? It was greenlit by the other four fucking families. For you people that want to like fucking scream rat and all this other stupid shit that you keep saying. If you knew anything about this, you wouldn't be saying the stuff you're saying. It's absolutely fucking ridiculous. And it goes even further back. John A. White said that Charlie Carnese gave him the 302 in 2006. Well, it was released in 2005, but sent to O Light, uh, to A. Light in 06. John A. White also said that's when he realized that John Gotti was allegedly ratting him out. The problem is, from 2005 to 2006, John Gotti Jr. goes to three trials, which was after the proffer session, so obviously he wasn't ratting anybody out. And also, to push that even further, if John Gotti Jr. is ratting people out, why is he on trial? Why is he dragged? Why is he going through diesel therapy? Why is he paying for all of this? Johnny White on the Rick Sanchez show even said anybody that sits down with any law enforcement that sits down to do any kind of 302 proffer session, no matter what the fuck it is, it's always going to be inaccurate. The agents write whatever the fuck they want. I could sit here and go on for the next fucking three hours on this subject. The bottom line is, I don't give a fuck what anybody thinks. I don't care. What I what I what does bother me is when the fucking pieces of scumbag shit like Frank Gaggi, who don't have any money, can't sell their bullshit narrative story, they get jealous because other people are making money and doing what they got to do. Then they want to jump on Witsec Mafia. Hello, Witsec Mafia is about government fucking corruption. It's about the government giving rats 
fucking deals and then letting them go out and break the fucking law and make money illegally, having no oversight on what they do, ruining other people's fucking lives. It's about the fucking goddamn rat getting rewarded for what they do. Why is it that you people cannot understand this? I am not defending John Gotti Jr. He's a big boy. He's an adult. He can defend himself. But what I'm not going to do is tolerate people coming to me talking shit about him. Go to him. You're a big tough guy, right? Go to him. Let him explain it. Or at least do yourself a favor and read a fucking piece of paper. Read, read a fucking illegal document. You want to tell, you know how many people tell me, oh, I got a copy of that 302. The fuck if you do. None of you do. You know what you guys got? You got a copy of the fucking 302 from George Anastasia, which is bullshit. Lies. George Anastasia wrote a book filled with fucking lies. Full well knowing their lies. The point of the matter is, I don't care what any of you honestly think about John Gotti Jr. I really don't care. My job isn't to defend him. I think, first of all, the fact that he admitted he came out publicly and said, yeah, you know, I sat down with the FBI. I didn't give them nothing. It was designed as a ploy to fuck them over. They realized it was a ploy to fuck them over, and they made me pay for it. And that's exactly what happened. Who went to jail? Name me one motherfucker that went to jail because he said anything. Name me anything out of that 302 where John Gotti Jr. testified against somebody. He said, well, this guy killed this guy, and that guy killed that guy. Nothing. Inconsequential bullshit. Inconsequential. So if we're going to go by this idea that if anybody talks to a cop, then they're a rat, then boy, I, I got some news for you. A lot of fucking people are rats. The term of a rat in the situation in which we are speaking is anyone that sits down with the federal government or law enforcement and rats and tells on everybody else to get themselves out of trouble criminally. If John Gotti Jr. did that, then prove it to me. Prove it to me. It used to be back in the day if you defended yourself in court, you were a rat. Go back to Chicago in the fucking 60s. Mad Sam Stefano starts to fucking defend himself in court. What does the mob do? They kill the motherfucker because of it. So don't sit here and try to play somebody else. They're all the same up and down. It's amazing to me. Nobody wants to stick to one set of rules. They want the rules to bend from one, bend to another. It doesn't work like that. In the old days, you took a plea, you got killed. Because you didn't admit it exists. So, so don't sit here and fucking tell me that you're, you're fucking better. Or that that doesn't really count because it's a different situation. It's the same fucking situation. You're in the motherfucking mafia. This shit is supposed to be goddamn secret. You're supposed to be quiet. You're not supposed to talk about your fucking friends. You're not supposed to talk to a cop. A cop says something, lock me up or get the fuck off my door. That's what I did. Not once did I ever say anything about fucking anybody. And I had people say shit against me in fucking court. That's a fucking rat move. They saved themselves. But for anybody to come on my page and say, I ratted out my brother or whatever, what the fuck are you talking about, you cokehead? Frank Ganji is about as fucking honest as fucking Pinocchio on a hot summer's day. That guy couldn't tell the truth to, to fucking Ed Scarpo. That's why Ed Scarpo threw him to the curb. A long time ago, Frank sent me his, uh, Ed actually sent me a bunch of uh, Frank's stuff. I couldn't verify any of it. So yeah, from, from a certain perspective, at, at one point, sure, I, I had some respect for Frank because he felt like he had to do what he had to do. He's still a fucking rat. But Frank has a problem with people calling people rats. Frank, I'm sorry if you can't make a dime off your fucking cocksucker fucking rat name. You want to be a light so fucking bad you can't stand it. And that's the other thing. One minute Frank says a light's a piece of shit, junkie, fuck, this, that, and the fucking third. Next he's saying he's a legitimate guy, a real guy, a street guy. <coughs> really, Frank? If everything that a light has ever said has been proven to be a fucking lie... A fucking lie, not truth. 
then what the fuck? I just get fucking tired of it. I don't give a fuck what people think. People, people, half these people that say this shit wouldn't say a fucking word to John Gotti Jr. to his face. And I'm going to tell you the other secret. Nobody in New York says that kind of shit about him. I know a lot of fucking people. Not one has something bad to say about him. Not one person says he's a fucking rat. It's always outsiders. And my point is, is that if you're going to regurgitate bullshit to me, then I'm going to regurgitate truth. And that's the fucking truth. You, you're you entitled to have your opinion. You can have your opinion. I don't give a fuck. But you, what you're not going to do is lie, because that's what you're doing. You're lying. You're not telling the truth. Or guess what? Don't take it out on me. Ask them yourself. Be a man. Ask them yourself. Ask them yourself. Because guess what? In the old days... Guess what? If you were related to somebody that was a rat, guess what that fucking made you? A fucking rat. Somebody, your whole bloodline would be fucking ruined if somebody in your family was a rat. So it just seems to me like people want to pick and choose and say all this kind of shit. And, and I don't get it. I don't care if you don't like John Gotti Jr. I don't care if you don't believe me. But what you're not going to do is use what John A. Light and George, the biggest fucking liar, rat piece of shit that ever existed, Anastasia. You're not going to tell me they're telling the truth and that's why you believe them. I'm especially not going to believe that shit coming from anybody that gives them tips. You, you know what I'm saying? I'm just not going to do it. So I stand by what I believe in. Junior is not a rat from as far as I'm concerned. Never did anything. He tried to abuse the government. He tried to get around them, and he fucking failed. And so they gave him diesel therapy. They gave him five trials in 37 fucking months. They hoarded every single one of his real estate deals, every single one of his bank accounts, harassed his fucking family, his sisters, his brothers, everybody. And they do that to informants? Where, where's your thinking here? They do that to informants? so listen that's all I get to say about it I just get aggravated with the whole thing because people bring this shit to me take it to him you want to be so fucking tough take it to him everybody's got a big fucking mouth outside of somebody's ears they're not going to say it in front of them oh no they're big and tough you know over here say it to him ask them why do you take the shit out on me I didn't put a gun in nobody's mouth and make them sit down with the cops so at the end of the day, while I can appreciate everybody's fucking opinion on the matter, you obviously don't fucking know, and you're listening to a rat. What does that say about you, that you're listening to a rat? Hello, whatever happened to the fucking days where you didn't believe a fucking rat? What is this world coming to? La Fanabla, I cannot believe this shit. We'll be back with Murray Humphreys. In my travels, I'm always looking for a clothing brand that I feel like represents me. Anybody can go to a store and buy a t-shirt with a gimmick, but if you believe in three core values like I do, loyalty, honor, and respect, then look no further than Omerta Brand Clothing. You can catch them at omertamia.com, O-M-E-R-T-A-M-I-A.com, with locations in Europe, California, Boston, Brooklyn, Florida, Pennsylvania, and Washington. They have a great clothing line with hats, shirts, sweatshirts, keychains, anything you might need, stickers. You want the rats to stop snitching? Go right out and get yourself a sticker. But if you want to live your life by the gentleman's code, look no further than Omerta Brand Clothing. And welcome back to Mob Talk Radio. I am your host, Jeff Canarsi. We are going to get to Murray Humphreys. Uh, originally, I was going to answer a couple questions, uh, but I went... Pretty much balls out the first 18 minutes. So I'm going to skip that and we'll include those questions on the Q&A next week. So let's go ahead and jump right into Murray Humphreys. Uh, Llewellyn Morris Humphreys was born April 20th, 1899 in Chicago. Uh, his parents, Brian and Anne, were from Carno, Wales. Uh, his parents left Wales uh, mainly because at that time in Wales... It was they. A lot of people were very poor, and they were destitute, and they came to the United States hoping that things would get better. Unfortunately, when they arrived, things didn't get a whole lot better. Uh, it was so awful that 
uh, Murray had to drop out of elementary school at age seven to end up going to work. Uh, in those days, that was actually quite common, uh, especially when you come from a family with a lot of children. Uh, so obviously, historically, we've seen that happen before. Uh, Murray would end up selling newspapers, uh, but it still wasn't enough to really help the family. So Murray decides to start stealing to support his family. Um, and that was really his intro into Chicago street gangs. By age 13, Murray was in the custody of Chicago judge Jack Murray, who tried to talk uh, Humphreys into becoming a cop. While Murray refused the judge's life lessons, uh, spoke to Murray, and it actually changed his perspective and taught him some valuable lessons that he would obviously take to the streets. Uh, soon after, he would end up changing his name legally to Murray Humphreys. Uh, Murray would soon go all in to a criminal life. He was involved in a lot of different things, jewel thefts, breaking and entering, uh, stolen, stolen goods, uh, bootlegging, and more. By age 16, he was serving a 60-day sentence for petty larceny in Chicago's Bridewell Jail. Uh, originally, he had been charged with a felony, uh, but he was charming, and what he did was he used his family's plight as an excuse for his behavior. It ended up working, and the prosecutor ended up changing the charges to a misdemeanor. Uh, after the prosecutor changed the charge, Murray Humphrey pretty much showed his cards. He told the prosecution that they would have never won anyway. And when they asked him why, he said, well, frankly, uh, essentially I'm 16. Nobody would believe a 16, it would have, a 16 year old would be guilty of these crimes. Besides, if they did, I'd end up crying on the stand and they'd see me as innocent. Uh, and that's why I'll plead guilty to petty larceny. We both kind of get what we want. So at a very young age, he was able to manipulate uh, prosecutors into sort of doing what he wanted. And he had a good argument. At 16, he would just cry on the stand and get away with it. And then he'd use the excuse of, hey, I'm 16. Uh, so he agreed to plead guilty to petty larceny. Uh, Murray Humphreys would continue robbing places, uh, breaking and entering, and, con and continue doing jewel thefts. In 1921, uh, he was under police scrutiny, so he fled to Chicago for his brother's home in Little Axe, Oklahoma. Uh, he would go on to work as a door-to-door -door salesman, but really what he was doing was casing homes for breaking and entering. Uh, he would meet Mary Brendel there, and they would end up getting married years later. They would go back to Chicago, and Murray would work as a short order cook on Halstead Street, and then he met Fred Evans. Uh, Evans was a small-time gangster who was looking for a partner who could help him get into the bootlegging business. Um, the problem was is that Evans couldn't figure out where to really get the supplies to do this. Uh, Murray Humphreys had a great idea. They would hijack other people's liquor uh, and sell it. And they would do this for a couple of years, and they would get away with it until Murray ended up hijacking uh, illegal liquor belonging to Al Capone. The driver of the truck would eventually identify Murray as the one who shoved a gun in his face and stole the truck and the belongings inside the truck. Capone would find out who it was and had his men grab Murray off the street and brought him to Capone's headquarters. Uh, Capone was absolutely furious, but after a couple of minutes of sitting with Murray Humphreys, he actually realizes that Murray had a lot of balls. Uh, he was taking whatever he couldn't procure the legal way. Uh, according to many sources, Murray smoothed it over, and Capone was really impressed with him. Uh, he would end up offering Murray a job, and then decades later, when someone asked Capone about finding Murray Humphreys, Capone would say, no, nobody hustles like the hump. Uh, at 27, Murray was put in charge of the racketeering side of business and would also whack some guys on behalf of Capone. So from an early age, not only can he handle the racketeering and the financial side of everything, but he also was willing to grab a gun and do some business. Uh, he would become known as the hump or the camel. Uh, the camel, camel moniker really comes from two things. It comes from his love of wearing camel hair coats, but realistically, it just came as a shortened version of his name, Humphreys the Hump, uh, which obviously a camel has. From the 1920s to the 1930s, Murray, along with Red Barker, William Three Finger, Jack White, uh, William Klondike O'Donnell, began infiltrating unions. This is what Murray's real panache was in the streets. He was able to infiltrate unions that were worth an awful lot of money, and we'll go into more details as we come along with that. Uh, in 1931, Murray gets uh, indicted for the 1931 kidnapping of Union President Robert Fitch, 
but was able to escape that conviction. In 1993, with Capone in federal prison for income tax evasion, Chicago State Attorney Office said that Murray was public enemy number one right behind Capone. Uh, later that year, Murray would be indicted for tax evasion himself, but he would end up fleeing. Uh, he would be on the run for 18 months before giving himself up in Indiana. He would end up pleading guilty and was sentenced to 18 months in Leavenworth. 13th month, 13 months later, he would leave Leavenworth. In 1933, Murray Humphrey arranged the fake kidnapping of John Jake the Barber Factor, uh, who was a British con artist wanted in England for stock swindling. Uh, Factor, who was Capone, close friend and associate, was facing extradition. The mob obviously wanted to step in and make sure he wasn't extradited, so the outfit effectively goes to work. They staged a fake kidnapping and framed uh, Capone's nemesis, Roger Terrible uh, Tui, for it. Uh, Tui would receive 99 years in prison for it, but ultimately would be released in 1959, only to be whacked six weeks later. Six, month, six months after Tui's uh, death, uh, Murray Humphreys claimed a life insurance claim on Tui's life. So Tui gets killed, and Humphreys goes to the insurance company and tries to claim the life insurance policy on Tui. Uh, Murray had actually bought shares with Tui's name on them. Uh, when Tui died, Murray collected $42,000. Now, think of the time. This is the 1930s. That's an awful lot of fucking money. Uh, the IRS gets suspicious immediately and begins to investigate. Turns out the policies were originally bought by John Factor. Uh, the IRS would ultimately claim that those policies were bought by Factor but given to Murray Humphreys' payment for the 1990, 1933 fake kidnapping of Factor himself. The IRS uh, then forced Murray to pay taxes on the policy, which he did. Uh, Murray was also known for exploiting uh, the double jeopardy in the Fifth Amendment and instructing his friends on how to use it correctly. That is huge, and the reason why that's huge is because a lot of these guys relied on lawyers to help them out of cases and stuff like that. The one thing that Murray Humphreys was really good at is he understood and knew how to fight double jeopardy. You can't be tried more than once for one crime, and he also taught them the meaning of the Fifth Amendment, which was basically witnesses cannot compel themselves to, to be witnesses against themselves in a criminal case, or in layman's terms, uh, basically not uh, indicting yourself into a crime. Uh, and he would pretty much argue that case for himself throughout the years, and he would also help other people uh, to sort of explain how to use that uh, adequately because at the time, a lot of people didn't know how to read the laws the right way. Uh, it would come in handy as the government witch hunts uh, began and the Senate hearings would, would commence. Uh, in 1956, Jake Greasy Thumb Guzik dies, which really at that point made – Murray, the, the mob's chief financial fixer and political fixer. Now, if you wanted to compare Murray Humphreys with really anybody of that time period, uh, he was a lot like Frank Costello in the extent that he just didn't have the panache to infiltrate himself into the unions, but he also was a political fixer. He could get in and fix political races and, and all kinds of things. And then on the offset of that and the back end of that, just from the racketeering aspect of being able to hide money and funnel money in a million different directions without anybody getting caught really made him, uh, a lot of people I've read call him the Tom Hagen of the Chicago mob. And, and I think while that is a an adequate description, I think Murray Humphreys probably at the bottom line, I mean, was a lot more fucking brutal than Tom Hagen. I don't think Tom Hagen ever picked up a gun uh, and used it. Um, but also, if you're looking for a comparison, uh, Murray Humphreys was a little bit like Meyer Lansky combined with Frank Costello. Uh, Lansky, in his younger days, wouldn't hesitate to kill somebody either. Uh, and, and Murray Humphreys really meant a lot to the Chicago mob. He was their strategist, he was their counselor, and he was the master schemer. He was the guy that could figure out how to get away with shit. Uh, to the point where it dumbfounded most of the Chicago mob, and it made him incredibly valuable. Uh, when Guz and, and to prove how intelligent Murray Humphreys was, when Guzik was killed, Murray knew that the body could not be found at the restaurant without compromising the mob's judicial resources. Uh, so Humphrey had the body removed and taken to the home of his wife, who would claim that he died and was killed at home. Uh, and that, when I say judicial resources, meaning that if a body is found 
in a restaurant, politically, anybody remotely associated with Murray Humphreys is going to say, well, you know, uh, Greasy Thumb Guzik was friends with Humphreys, and that looks bad politically. And Humphreys recognizes this, so he quickly gets the body out of the fucking restaurant, puts it at the house. That way there's not any real, real publicity as far as a, a public execution, so to speak. Um, Murray single-handedly put the nation's richest labor unions in the hands of the Chicago mob. Uh, the move was worth billions. We're not talking about a carpenter's union and a plumbing union. We're talking every single fucking union that had a ton of cash Murray Humphreys was able to infiltrate and able to hold on to it with his fist that brought millions of do- billions of dollars not millions billions of dollars into the Chicago mob uh, he also handed Chicago the gambling industry uh, he could be Frank Costello but he also could be Albert Anastasia in a second uh, the fact that he was an earner and a killer made him once again insanely valuable to the outfit uh, he would also end up becoming Sam Giancana's most trusted advisor uh, the two had similar issues but reacted differently uh, once when Giancana was being tailed by the FBI he became enraged put his foot on the gas and started a race between him and the feds Murray on the other hand was a little different uh, Murray noticed one time that the FBI was following him he had gotten tired of it they were following him all day He'd had enough, and what he does is he pulls over, he gets out, and tells his driver, go on home, don't worry about me. He approaches the FBI car, taps on the window, they roll it down, and he says, you know what, you've been following me all day, no need for two cars, I'll ride with you, and he hops in the back seat, and he ended up taking them out for lunch. So in a lot of ways, even though the, even though Murray Humphreys was uh, certifiably uh, a guy that could kill somebody and have not a problem doing it. He was a dignitary in the sense that he would rather keep it quiet and keep it, you know, sort of even keel rather than draw attention to himself. Uh, it was a lesson that Giancana probably should have learned but didn't. Uh, both Giancana and Humphreys both topped the FBI's top hoodlum list. The, the top hoodlum list was a program put into operation in 1957 for the purpose of combating organized crime, the mafia in particular. Uh, the Top Hoogland program was a result of Appalachian. J. Edgar Hoover would invent it. And basically, it was just designed to go after the syndicate and Cosa Nostra bosses through North America. They would target Giancana, Magadino, Genovese, Bonanno, Humphreys, Gambino, Costello, Lansky, Marcello, and about everybody you could possibly think of that was involved in the life at the time. Uh, William Romer... Uh, who is a, I think he's deceased now, but he was a big FBI agent back in the day, was in a lot of historical stuff. Uh, He would lead the FBI at the time, and they would discover that a second floor tailor shop on North Michigan Avenue was a frequent meeting place for Murray Humphreys, Tony Accardo, Sam Giancana, and Gus Alex, uh, which were all mob heavyweights at the time. The FBI would uh, would install a hidden microphone in the shop after the shop closed, and for five years, the mic went undetected. Uh, Murray Humphreys is also known for being kind. I I know a lot of people are probably going to roll their eyes uh, because a lot of people can't look past the the bloodshed uh, in some of the stories that we tell on this show. Uh, But he was kind in many respects. The FBI noted that when Murray Humphrey uh, would travel to his second home in Oklahoma where his wife was from, he would hand out silver dollars, buy turkeys and clothes for the less fortunate. Uh, He especially looked after... Uh, Cherokee Indian Native American children uh, because at the time they really didn't have anything his wife was actually part Cherokee and and that's where his love of the Cherokee people came from Uh, he would also look after newly released convicts who needed homes and job he'd find them a place to live or he'd find them a job he also made sure that the widows of murdered mobsters and disabled associates that were shot say in warfare wanted for nothing so not only did he take care of uh, indian children uh and homeless people but he took care of his own people at the same time and and that's that's to a throwback era you don't see that uh these days uh often what you have a tendency is seeing is greed these days uh and murray humphreys was not like that uh he looked out for his own and made sure that if, if somebody's husband died in the streets or went to prison he made sure that their wife and children wanted for nothing uh, FBI agents who saw Murray Humphreys doing things, doing these things, 
really kind of grew to admire him. Uh, one agent actually said on the record that of all the mob guys, he was the most caring and had the most human qualities that I've ever seen in any gangster. Uh, Murray would eventually split up with his wife, and then in 1957, his wife would file for divorce. Uh, Murray would then marry his mistress, but he always remain, remained close to his ex-wife, would have dinner with her once a week, and, and would always maintain a relationship with his children. Uh, Murray had developed a heart condition uh, and would end up buying a home in Florida with the idea of totally retiring. But the problem was is that the mob valued him too much, and there was too much money to be made without him overseeing it. And so what they did was they allowed him what's called a soft retirement, which meant he was still in, but he didn't have to do nearly as much as he used to do. Um, and moving forward past that, we're going to talk about the Estes Kafafer hearings for a minute. If you don't know who Estes Kafafer is, he's known for the hearings. Murray Humphreys wanted him dead for a long time. Uh, and the reason why, and, th and this will show you the repulsion of these Senate committee hearings. Uh, you know, listen, they, they had a reason to have these these committee hearings, and I get it. There's certain things you say, certain things you don't. Uh, when Murray Humphreys was sequestered, uh, at the Kafafer hearings, Estes brought up that Murray Humphrey's daughter, Luella, who since she was born, had a lot of mental problems. I don't know specifically uh, what the mental problems were. I mean, we're not talking like retardation or anything like that. We're, you know, anxiety, uh, bipolar probably, stuff like that. Uh, and because really Murray Humphreys isn't going to say a lot, Estes Kafafer decides that it would be a good idea to poke fun at his daughter with a disability. Um, and the interesting thing is Luella was really good at music, so good, in fact, that Murray Humphrey sent her to, Eng sent her to England to learn how to play piano, but her mental issues were just so severe that she just really wasn't going to have much of a life. Now, she would end up going on and getting married to an Italian guy and having a child, but she would never really be able to be the mother that, that she probably could have been uh, had psychiatry in those days been what they are today. Uh, ultimately, Murray would have to have her committed in Topeka, Kansas in 1958. But under questioning, Estes would ask Murray, isn't your daughter nuts? I mean, isn't she crazy? Uh, and it was an, it, what it was was an effort to publicly embarrass and shame Murray Humphreys. And all it did was aggravate Murray to the point where he wanted Estes Kafafer killed. Uh, but that never happened uh, obviously. In 1965, Sam Giancana was jailed by William J. Campbell for refusing to answer questions regarding mob activities. Uh, Campbell blocked Giancana's plan to plead the Fifth Amendment by announcing that Giancana would be offered immunity for anything self-incriminating that Giancana might reveal. That's actually a very, very slick legal remedy. Uh, Giancana is going to use the fifth. So here's what we'll do. We're just going to say that he's going to get offered immunity for anything he might say. So that essentially takes the Fifth Amendment off the table. Um, but Giancana obviously would refuse to do that, would get charged with contempt, uh, and he would be jailed for the duration of the grand jury or until he chose to cooperate. And ultimately, this hearing is what would probably start the time clock for the end of Giancana's life. Uh, as the hearings kept going, he kept getting a little more bold, a little bit more loud. Uh, he was seen more publicly, was hanging out with the McGuire sisters who were absolutely atrocious. Uh, he just put himself in some situations that weren't too bright. Uh, three weeks later, uh, Murray Humphreys was issued a subpoena to appear before the same grand jury. When William Romer showed up at Murray's making uh, Murray's Marina Tower apartment to deliver a subpoena, he was met at the door by Ernest Humphreys, who was Murray's brother, who informed Romer that his brother had packed and left for parts unknown. The problem was is Romer spots a silk blue blazer sitting on the chair. Romer ends up leaving, uh, and Romer also knew that because Murray Humphreys was going blind in one eye, that there was no way Murray Humphreys was going to take a plane, and that reality was is that Murray Humphreys would always take a train, and Murray Humphrey only went Humphreys only ever went to the same place, and that's Oklahoma. So what he does is he sends uh, a bunch of agents uh, out to Norman, Oklahoma, where the first train stop would be, and hurries, uh, Murray Humphreys ends up coming off the train, and the agents arrest him. And the reason why they were able to do that was because he was wearing the blue blazer. So. 
that meant that because he was wearing the same blue blazer that he was either in the apartment when the, when the FBI showed up and told them they had a subpoena, which made him culpable to have to go, or they at least knew that he knew that they were there. Uh, and that's what was able to allow them to, uh, to arrest him. Uh, they would end up taking him back to Chicago and um, blah, blah, blah. he was official and, and Murray Humphreys would be officially charged uh, with perjury. Uh, the agents would go to Humphreys apartment and arrest him again because obviously he was he was let out, went to court, they arraigned him, he was let out, they go back to arrest him. and as they knock on the door, uh, the 66-year-old answered with a snub-nosed 38 burner in his hand, threatening to kill him. The agents would end up wrestling him to the ground uh, and taking the gun out of his hand. Then they searched the apartment. Uh, it was an illegal search, uh, but Murray's law expertise failed him this time. Murray Humphreys knew a lot about the law, but the one thing that he failed to realize was they did not have a right to illegally search his apartment without a search warrant, but he didn't realize that. So what ends up happening is they spot a safe while they're doing a search and they realize they can't get into the safe. So they ask Murray for the key, which he obviously refuses to do. A fight ensued and the FBI just takes the key out of his pocket. They end up opening the safe and took Murray uh, and all of its contents downtown to the police station. Uh, Murray Norman would end up posting bail for Murray. Later on that night at 830, Ernest Humphrey would find his brother Murray Humphrey face down on the floor. Uh, Murray would end up dying of a heart attack while vacuuming. Funeral arrangements were made uh, by his former wife. Uh, his son George and daughter Lu uh, Luella would end up coming in from Oklahoma. Agent Romer greeted them at the airport saying how he liked Murray and while he was a murderer, his word was always his bond and that he respected him. Uh, his daughter Luella would actually die in 1992 at age uh, 57. Uh, and some random facts about Murray Humphreys uh, was, here's a quote, if you ever have to cock a gun in a man's face, kill him. If you walk away without killing him after doing that, he will kill you the next day. Uh, the other quote he is known for is when uh, Courtney was the state's attorney and all of us guys got indicted, Nitty was hollering like hell. We broke through and got the, the assistant state attorney and we got the witnesses and let me tell you i had the jury too just in case that's the way we got to revert to these days and, and basically what he meant was you buy or you control if you can buy and control nobody gets indicted uh he named his dog snorky after al capone uh he inspired the character of tom hagan in the godfather uh giancana called humphrey the nicest guy in the mob and looking back and, and granted i know this is a particularly short show uh but there isn't a ton of information out there that i could procure in, in in a couple of days uh but the one interesting thing i think about murray humphreys looking at the archetype for who he was he was involved in some very big things he came along in a time period uh when non-italians could only go so far uh, guys that could control politicians were always valuable to the mob. And in this case, Murray Humphrey was incredibly valuable to them. Not only did he bring all the unions, and, and when you bring in all the unions, when I say that it directly leads to the gaming industry, it did. Uh, granted, we know that Bugsy Siegel in those days was out there, but in order to secure the pension funds, in order to secure the union funds to build, they had to come from somewhere. And the guy that was directly in control of that, obviously, was Meyer Lansky. But it was through Meyer Lansky that Murray Humphreys was able to do what he did. Now, in comparison to Tom Hagen, Murray Humphreys wasn't a lawyer. But the one thing that Murray Humphreys was, was he was a dignitary in the sense that he was able to procure things without having to use a gun. He could be diligent and uh, sort of uh, being a businessman. And I don't want to use Donald Trump as a reference because, I, I, you know, my thing with Donald Trump. But, but a lot like Donald Trump in the art of business, it, he knew how to make deals that were best for everybody. And he wouldn't step on any toes. And he was highly valuable and sought after because of his ability to do things without violence. Now, don't get me wrong. He would uh, definitely, uh, under many, 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 many circumstances, get violent. Uh, but it wasn't really the best business nature for him to do that. Um, now, as far as Giancana goes, 
and and this is a theory of mine, and and obviously I can't prove it because honestly I could sit here and talk about Giancana for a long time too. Uh, but I think ultimately that Murray Humphreys at some point, now obviously Murray Humphreys died before Giancana did, but I think that Murray Humphreys probably knew early on what was going to happen to Giancana. They were very tight, but I don't think Murray Humphreys trusted him very much. And I say that because Murray Humphreys grew up around guys who weren't showboaters. Granted, we can make the argument that Al Capone was a showboater, and he was. Uh, but anything short of, of prostitution and drugs, Al Capone really, at the end of the day, uh, isn't really your prototypical uh, gangster in the sense. He didn't look at himself as a mafia guy. He looked at himself as a gang member. And, and there, that's the big difference between uh, Chicago in those days and in New York in those days. Uh, Murray Humphreys was able to attain a status that we haven't really seen. Uh, I, I, I think almost in comparison to a, a Jimmy Burke or to even Joe Watts, I, I think that he had changed. He, I, I'm definitely above Joe Watts, but the idea here is that his skills, his skill set of being able to be an earner and not being afraid to pull a trigger, I think ultimately put him in the position it did. And when you're in the position like that, uh, I think guys that can earn and that aren't afraid to use a gun are the guys that really live a long time. They're able to outlive everybody else, and the reason why is because they put they put profit before personal feelings and I think that that's something that a lot of people ask me over time what's the major difference between a mafia today and say in 1960 uh, profit and money has always been number one but a lot of the times you'll see personal shit overtake the bottom line and the bottom line is always money uh, Carlo Gambino uh, and this is post Masseria post Anastasia and all of that mess uh, Gambino realized Profit and money were better than anything. There was no reason for Carlo Gambino to be out on the streets clubbing. There was no reason for Carlo Gambino to be seen. He could live a life, live off his riches, and want for nothing, live in a very normal house, drive a very normal car. That's the way these things did. You look at guys like Capone, way too public. You look at Giancana, way too public. I mean, Giancana would consistently go to the Calv Neva Lodge, which was owned by Frank Sinatra. He fucked Saint Frank Sinatra out of his gaming license, fucked Frank Sinatra out of the Calv Neva Lodge because he couldn't stop causing problems. I think Sam Giancana historically wasn't really a good boss. I think he got the job by proxy. Uh, he was reckless. And I think that anytime that you're looking for a narrative uh, of what a mob boss should be, it should be somebody relatively quiet, somebody relatively unknown, somebody that just does what they got to do, earn their money, keeps everybody on the same page, and leaves it at that. The minute you get guys like Nicky Scarfo uh, around, uh, guys that cannot control their ego and guys can, that cannot control their emotions, that's when shit gets reckless. And, and that's why guys like Scarfo end up the way they do. Uh, you, you cannot – the days of guys shooting each other in the street are probably over. I, I can't imagine I'm going to see a scenario ever again where a guy is going to take a gun on the streets. Uh, things are different these days, and, and that was – to sort of jump back to the beginning of the show, the, the shit I was ranting about is that with everything in life, right, there's an ebb and flow. Things change over time. I mean look at the way we have social media today. Uh, back in the old days, like when I was a kid, right? Like, let's go back to the 60s. You had to pick up a payphone. You, you couldn't just use a cell phone. You picked up a payphone to call somebody. When I was a kid, they still had payphones. They still do it now, I think, somewheres. Uh, but to go find your friends, you followed the bikes. Oh, look, there's Tommy's bike. There's Jimmy's bike. They're all here. You had to go and find somebody. Now everything is just so much changed by social media and the advancement of technology that it's just different. And so and I and I say that to say this about rules. What's valid in 1960 isn't necessarily valid today. The mob was not doing stock fraud back in the day. They weren't doing pump and dump schemes. They weren't using cell phones, boosted cell phones. They weren't these are things they didn't do. Hijacking, prostitution, drugs, extortion, Shylock and numbers racket. That was the hub, swag. Those were the eight hub things that they did. Murder nine okay so we'll add nine things but today today's climate is different but my point is is that we're talking about the rules here you know if we're gonna if we're gonna go by a rule set 
I'm not talking about what Hollywood says it is. I, reality here. What What is real? If there's a rule set and you're going to go by the rules, right? And, and here's one instance. It was okay for Carlo Gambino to whack Albert Anastasia, Joe Massaria, and be involved in all of that. It was okay for him to do that. But it wasn't okay for John Gotti Sr. to kill Paul Castellano. Why is that different? If they did it, the rule, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. And, and that's why I said what I said at the beginning of the show. Because if you're going to sit here and tell me that anybody that does X, Y, and Z is, is B, then everybody across the board is. You can't just pick and choose. And that's what we see a lot in today. Social media has really destroyed <laughs> so much crap in this world. But back to Murray Humphreys. Sorry, I got on a tangent. Uh, at the end of the day, Murray Humphreys, I think, looking back, you know, he almost had a, a consigliere type of role. Uh, the fact that he was able to get them broaden horizons for gaming, broaden horizons for drugs, broaden horizons. This was a guy that knew how to, to hide money. This is a guy that knew how to invest it, how to put it here so they wouldn't get caught. And he was a fucking genius. Uh, like Frank Lefty Rosenthal was a genius with numbers. This was kind of the same deal. Uh, granted, uh, Murray Humphreys was not the financial guy for odds making, but he just was able to uh, procure unions. Uh, if you go back to the early, if you go back to the 60s, Carlo Gambino, and a lot of people don't know this, and this is a reference point, uh, a lot of people don't know the whole Eastern Seaboard was owned by the Gambino crime family. I don't care what anybody tells you. Uh, the, the port in Norfolk, Virginia, which was Longshoreman's Union, was run by the Gambino crime family. I know so because I knew the guy that ran the Longshoremen's Union for like 20 years back in the fucking day. We're not talking like in the, in the 90s. We're talking like back in the day, back in the day. Uh, it was run by them. The port was controlled, could be shut down by the mafia. They controlled what came in and what didn't. Uh, and so from that comes power. When you can control what happens and, and name me one person that has that power today to control the eastern seaboard. They could shut it down with the snap of fingers. They could shut a union down if they didn't like the way something was going. They could shut down the jobs, 50 job sites. Those days are fucking over. Uh, but that's the difference between 1960 and today. And that's why a guy like Murray Humphreys was so important because he could control and bring the unions. Those unions didn't just bring them a couple hundred grand, billions of dollars to the Chicago mob. Those unions controlled. He controlled everything. Capone didn't need to go there with a gun. He sent Murray Humphreys. Murray Humphreys would go, and whatever his tactic might have been, I'm sure there was some strong arm action going on. I'm sure there was a lot of stuff with Jimmy Hoffa and the Teamsters and that going on, but Murray Humphreys was able to own those, you know, and he could have just as easily been a greedy prick, taken as much money as he can, given just enough up to the higher guys to get away with it and live his life, but he didn't. He believed in share sharing he believed in equal equal opportunity and that's the big difference between him and a lot of other people is that he believed in he didn't believe that he was higher up he didn't believe that he was uh more important than anybody else he recognized what his station in life was recognized how important he was and he just did what he was supposed to do that's the problem with a lot of guys today they think they're more important than the next fucking guy. They get greedy, and then 50 guys get arrested. Murray Humphreys never got anybody arrested but himself. Never named anybody, never did, you know, nothing. And so I think looking back on that time period of, of Chicago, I think Murray Humphreys gets overlooked, probably because he was a non-Italian, non-made non member. But if you look at what he was able to achieve in a relatively short amount of time, uh, and a guy that truly went from the gutter uh, to the palace, uh, and, and that's not in any way, shape, or form to, to sort of uh, give prudence or, 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 or make somebody who's a gangster look like a saint, because that's not reality. But you have to marvel at a guy like that who came from nothing and attained something and then didn't get greedy with it, didn't say, no, it's never enough. I want more, I want more, I want more. What he had was enough. Everybody prospered, and that's the kind of guy that in those circles is worshipped because it wasn't about himself. It was about everyone around him. It was about everybody as, as a conglomerate, and that's what the mob was supposed to be. Luciano designed it this way, that it was supposed to be something that everybody would benefit from, but 
as history always repeats itself, greed always overtakes everything. And that's the big problem. It's never enough. It's never enough. And so that's what we got from Murray Humphreys. I'm sorry it could have been a better show, a longer show. Uh, but next week, I think we're going to do a really in-depth Q&A. So submit all your questions over uh, at Real Mob Talk 7 on Twitter or hit us up on Mob Talk Radio on Facebook. Uh, also, if you're new to this uh, radio show or new to the page in general, check out Mafia Ties. Uh, it's a TV series that's going to showcase Danny Green. If you're unfamiliar with Danny Green, check out over on YouTube, Mob Talk Radio. We did a show on Danny Green. Uh, Danny Green's a fucking legend for a lot of ways. Uh, he was an informant, yes, but his story is incredibly interesting, uh, as a lot of guys' stories are. Uh, so check that out. Type in uh, Mafia Ties on Facebook and click a like. See what they're all about. Watch the trailer. Watch interviews. Uh, just sort of see what there is to see. Okay. Now, there's one other thing I wanted to mention before I get out of here, and that's with Sec Mafia. Uh, there seems to be... Uh, a tremendous that dumb fuck Frank Ganji seems to get it twisted too. Let me explain what Witsec Mafia is, okay? A lot of people are saying that Witsec Mafia is somehow is telling on people, and okay, that's not what it is. Uh, if you really want to understand what Witsec Mafia is all about, you can do two things. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it, but I want you to reach out to Chris Casparosa. He's on Twitter at Chris Casparosa, I believe, or you can check on Twitter at Witsec Mafia, or you can go to johnnylightfacts.com, or just type in on Facebook Chris Casparosa. Reach out to him. He's a producer on it. Uh, he's one of the, th- the one of the three guys behind that project. He can really give you a better fucking answer than I'm going to give you, and he can probably give you a more appropriate answer than I can. So it would be unfair of me to sort of step on his toes and talk about that. Um, but John Gotti also has a film out, or not a film, excuse me, a YouTube video where he talks about with Tech Mafia and what it's about. But here's the crux of it, okay? From what I understand. Uh, is that the government has long been corrupt. Uh, the FBI has been corrupt. We can go back to, to Greg Scarpa and the shit he pulled while he was an informant and the FBI knew he was still killing people while he was an FBI informant getting a paycheck. Uh, Anthony Persiano, good example. This is going on right now in Jersey where he robbed $160,000 from Rima Navone while he was under FBI's watch and FBI's payment. Uh, there are other people that have committed atrocious crimes. You look at John Connolly, who's a disgraced FBI agent. Lynn Del Vecchio, disgraced FBI agent, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Whitey Bulger, in that sort of instance. The idea that that the FBI allows informants to join the WITSEC mafia, or excuse me, they join WITSEC, right? So they get into WITSEC, they're supposed to live their, their lives a certain way, certain protocols they have to go through, and a lot of these guys sign themselves out of WITSEC, which means they essentially go right back to where they grew up, and what they do is they start breaking laws, like immediately. They go right back to the streets, selling drugs, doing all kinds of crazy shit, with no oversight from the FBI at all. It's almost like the FBI sort of like turns a fucking blind eye to this. And the problem with that is, is that it's not right. If, and I don't like informants, but I could understand it from a, from a certain mental aspect of you informed, Therefore, you're for, some of your sins are forgiven. You do some time, you get out, and you just shut the fuck, fuck up and move on with your life. Totally understand that on a certain level. I don't agree with it, but it is what it is. The problem is a lot of these guys are doing that shit, and the FBI doesn't hold them accountable. They turn a blind eye to it. They're still under FBI protection. So they still have FBI handlers. These people know what they're doing. Why don't they stop it? Are they still active informants? 90% of the time they are. So what would Tech Mafia is going to do is it's going to showcase a bunch of cases and instances where guys testified against other people and under most cases lied about the testimony, get out of get the get the get out of prison free card, right? They go right back to the streets, hanging out with the same guys on the street corner, hanging out with the same bikers, the same Nazis, whatever it is that these people are doing. And they go right back to, to fucking breaking the law. And the FBI does nothing. Or in some cases, while they're an active informant, they break laws and the FBI doesn't hold them accountable. You're not allowed to do certain things under a fucking cooperation agreement. Ask J.R. Rubio, who broke every single fucking rule that you're not supposed to break while you're a fucking FBI informant. 
and that got thrown in his face in court, and I firmly believe that that's one of the reasons why the jury didn't believe a fucking word that J.R., that piece of shit, scumbag, rat, fuck Rubio, had to say against Joey Merlino. And so that's what Witsec Mafia is about. It's calling rats what they are, and it's showcasing that the fact that the FBI turns a blind eye to this stuff. That's what Witsec Mafia is about. It's not about being a crime fighter. It's not about being a tattletale. It's not about any of those things. So if you want further information about Witsec Mafia, go to witsecmafia.com. Contact Chris, Chris Casparosa. Go to at witsecmafia.com or at witsecmafia on Twitter. Ask him. Ask him. He'll give you a very definitive uh, answer. Or go to YouTube, type in John Gotti Jr. Witsec Mafia and watch the video for yourself. But before you start spewing lies, rumors, and just nonsense, know what you're talking about. Uh, and that's the thing that upsets me most. And, and, and I'm going to apologize for like going crazy the first 18 minutes. But what everybody has to understand is... I get really sick and fucking tired of the lies. A lot of this stuff, a lot of this stuff is regurgitated shit from informants, rats, and scumbags who don't know anything. They say this stuff because this is what an author says, or this is what this person says, or what that person says. The problem is it's not accurate. It's a narrative that they want you to believe. And if anybody comes to me and says, well, the FBI would never put out false information, really? They did it for Greg Scarpa for like 20 fucking years. What makes you think under any fucking circumstances? Sammy Gravano lied on the stand. Why do you think Gaspipe Casso's fucking uh, cooperation agreement got, got torn up? The FBI is going to tell you it's because, wow, well, he was knocking guys, extorting guys in prison, beating guys up. No, it's because Gaspipe directly fucking made Sammy Gravano's testimony look like the fucking lies that they were. Because that's what they were, lies. Sammy Gravano was selling drugs. He told the FBI he didn't sell drugs. Gaspipe Castle says, wait a fucking minute. Yes, he did. He killed a bunch more people than 19, and he sold a lot of drugs. FBI was like, shut him up, shut him up, shut him up. Because it would make their biggest fucking informant they've ever had look like the lying dog fuck that he is. That's why Gaspipe's fucking cooperation agreement got torn up. That's the truth. That's the truth. Has nothing to do with anything else other than that. And that's the bottom line. So to sit there and say that there's a hypocrisy here, and that's the point. Don't believe fucking lies. Don't believe rumor. Everybody's got an opinion. Look at the facts. If you find the facts and they say one thing to you, then so be it. I can't obviously change your mind. And my job here isn't to change your mind. My job is to tell you what's true and what isn't true. And the fact is there's a lot of things that are being said that aren't fucking accurate. You know, and, and this has been a myth that's been distorted by an author who hasn't written an honest book, and that's the fucking truth. Uh, and he wrote a book about a guy with a guy who can't tell the truth. So the question becomes, why are we believing people that lie? When did, when did, this, when did society go from, let's listen to the guy that didn't tell on, on anybody and let's believe the guy that told on everybody. His own fuck. This this guy told on his own brother for Christ's sakes, you know. So I mean, let's be real. Let's be realistic here about what we allow ourselves to believe, because the truth is none of that happened. Uh, a lot of people have a narrative that they want to spin. A lot of people like Jerry Capici want a newspaper they want to sell. They want to sell an article, and that's fine. But the problem is, is that you also have to look at why the FBI puts out certain information. Go back to Jack alone. Look up what happened to Willie Boy Johnson in court. Who the fuck, what kind of prosecutor stands up and says, well, he's a rat in front of everybody? Who does that? She sealed his fucking death sentence right then and there. And I'm not saying him getting murdered is justified in any stretch of the imagination. But, I mean, come on, it's the mob. This is what they do. Uh, so, to sit there and say that a, a rat and, and an author who covers a rat's lies are telling the truth and everybody else is lying. It's just absolutely fucking disgusting. And it's not accurate. But, like I said, you're entitled to believe what you want. You can believe the Frank Ganges of the world and, and everybody else. I, I really don't care. You are entitled to your opinion. You are always going to be entitled to your opinion. But I have a tendency in believing fact. I don't believe bullshit. You know, and I wish people would at least give me the respect enough to ask me. Because I'm telling you it's a fact. They're lies. All of it, all of it, all of it is lies designed to make somebody look awful. 
You know, the government told us for how long that they, they weren't trying to kill Castro. That that would never happen. They never employed the mafia to do that. They lied. They fucking lied. It's proof. So don't sit here and tell me that, that this is the one time the FBI told the truth. Come on, it's bullshit. Okay, the FBI lies for a living. Uh, they misconstrue facts. They misconstrue 302s. I sat in a fucking Joey Merlino's trial and I listened to J.R. Rubio lie. I listened to Wayne Kreisberg lie. I listened, I listened to the prosecution fucking lie. And the prosecution's lies were based off of lies. They were fucking lies. If they were true, I would tell you they were true. But they were fucking lies. Joey didn't do anything fucking wrong. Nothing. And so what? Because they said it's true, I should say it's true? Get the fuck out of here. All right, that's all we got for this week. Reach out to me on Twitter at RealMobTalk7. Check us out on Mob Talk Radio on Facebook. Reach out to Chris Casparosa. Uh, there is a Gangsters Inc. article, which I can link to the YouTube page, which takes you to uh, court files and stuff like that regarding the Gotti 302, which if I don't include, reach out to Chris Casparosa, and I'm sure he'll be more than glad to send them to you. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll be back next week with an all-new show. Remember, send all your questions in now. Start start getting your questions in as soon as possible, and I will cover every single one. My word. Have a great weekend, everybody.